it's 11 o'clock on the first Sunday of the month. And this time we have a live from the lab session where we take you up close with science. And we are just outside the national NMR facility. It's a bit scary out here. Look at this. Look at what it says. Ooh. Okay. I don't have a pacemaker. I should be good. But let's see if anyone's there. Hello. Hello. Anyone there? Okay. So we're going to be doing a session of Chai and Y. Welcome. Uh, unfortunately, still not at Prithvi Theatre, but this is an excuse to take you into the labs at the IFR. With me is Kunika. Uh, she's a third year PhD student in chemistry. You've seen her before at the Milk Chai and Y, and also I think at the Holy Chai and Y. Uh, she, uh, and she's going to be sort of uh, taking us through the lab today. And uh, ah, okay, here we are. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi, Munda. Hi. Good Hi. morning, yes. Uh, so let me introduce uh, Mamta Joshi. She is the uh, scientist in charge of the National NMR facility, and uh, she will be sort of taking us through the lab today. So with that, let's try and get in. Any, any, yeah. all these scary notices? Yes, yes. A very good morning to you all. Just before entering the laboratory, I have to warn you that you are entering a restricted area which has got very high magnetic fields to the tune of 18 tesla, that is 180,000 gauge. So I am sure you don't have any pacemaker in your body, but I just want just to the sure. Yeah, okay. But just to be sure that you don't have any metallic implants in your body. And of course, because you will be going a bit closer to the magnet, I want to ensure that your uh, mobile phone your credit or debit card, if you have any coins in, the, in your wallet, everything has to be kept aside. Is that clear? Okay, so we're going to put everything, metal, magnetic, everything outside. Yes. This, this sounds worse than airport security, but let's hope that it's something yeah. good at the end. I'm not going to put you through any x ray machine. Don't worry. Come. All right, let's get to the NMR now. So I'm here to learn about NMR as I needed to uh, like characterize one of the molecules that I have synthesized in my lab. So can you help me with the NMR technique? Yes, yes, sure. Now, first we will start with a simple NMR uh, sample and we have got two high field NMR instruments, the 600 megahertz and the 800 megahertz. Okay. So because oh, wow, this is big. You've got to climb up a ladder to go there. Yes, yes. You have to be fit to do NMR. So you have to actually, because you're doing your sample for a first time, I suggest you work on the 600 megahertz. So what we do is, I have a sample which is ready and I'm going to do NMR on this. I can show you how you do it. So the sample was a solid powder. I dissolved it in a deuterated solvent. Okay. And now... I'm going to put it in the superconducting magnet. So how do I do it? So there is a spinner in which I put the sample slowly. You have to be careful. And then there is this height gauge. Okay. So I put the sample and the spinner in the height gauge and measure the volume of the sample such that I'm sure that the coils of the magnet, okay, of the probe in the magnet they will be able to irradiate the sample with the right radio frequency. Okay. Once I measure it, now I am ready to put the sample in the magnet. How do I do it? Just come close to the magnet with me. So I have to clamp it. And mind you, now I cannot put the sample inside the magnet just under gravity because what will happen is it will crash land inside the magnet. There is a switch here. Can you hear the sound? Yes, yes. Yeah, so now that means the air pressure, I have put on the air pressure, air cushion and I am putting the sample in this bore. Okay, so if, if you can focus on this, it will now remain floating on this particular system till I put off the pressure. Now I'm going to switch off this button. Can you see? Zoom, the sample went and sat inside the magnet. 
but actually inside the magnet there is a probe i will tell you later about the probe what are these lead stripes marked here yeah so this is as i told you you are entering very high magnetic field so this red marking is to indicate the five watt line so only trained people are allowed to enter the five watt line nobody else is allowed so once i put the sample in the magnet then all my controls are on the computer okay please not go too far so what is the second instrument here yeah so this is the another high field instrument 800 mega which we normally use for bigger molecules so if you are not getting a good spectrum with the 600 mega then i will allow you to use the 800 mega which is capable of even more advanced experiments so the technique sounds quite interesting can you briefly explain me the principle it works on and like how is it so unique yeah please sit sure. thank you so i will just take you through uh, some information slides uh, on uh, nmr which will explain you some theory and also some practical aspects of nmr so you want to know what is what is the specialty of nmr why it's so unique right so the best part about nmr is that once you have put your sample in the magnet then you can after your experiment is over you can recover your sample you must be knowing that people take mri the doctors prescribe mri when they want to know something about your body some problem is there and something is not functioning so they tell the patient goes inside the magnet okay i'll show you about that in the in one of the slides and then after the experiment is done they get an image like how you take an x-ray like that but the patient comes back unharmed so that is the beauty of this technique you you put like x-ray also is a bit damaging it it is some radiation but in this radiation nothing happens to the sample or the human being who goes inside the magnet okay you can recover it another important thing is that besides being non invasive you get structural details that is you get atomic level structural information when you do nmr another important thing is that you can change the sample temperature or you can change the ph you can change the pressure and then observe the nmr spectrum how it changes with these property changes also you can do nmr quantification okay you can know how many protons are resonating or how many carbons are resonating at a particular chemical shift scale you can do in solid state or you can do in solution state but here i am going to show you only solution state we do not have a solid state nmr instrument and you can also probe the dynamics of big molecules if you want to by doing more advanced experiments okay so kunika i would like you to see the first generation nmr spectrometer which was used in the 1950s okay can you see this yes so, yes yeah so this was a very simple spectrometer but it was capable of giving information and that was very important at that time also i would like you to see the nmr spectrum got from this spectrometer of ethyl alcohol can you look at the spectrum there yes you see how bright right corner right yes yes you can see how broad the lines are but you are eventually getting three lines corresponding to the three different types of protons in ethyl alcohol okay but you are lucky that you do not have to work on this spectrometer you have such advanced and sophisticated nmr spectrometers yeah the technique sounds quite informative can you briefly tell me like how the what are the principles of nmr and how i can get information out of it yeah so you need to say that you want to know what is the theory yeah, okay so i can say that because we are talking about nuclear magnetic resonance okay it means and it is obvious that we are looking at certain properties of the nucleus okay so what does the nucleus have it has got protons and neutrons okay and what happens is that they have got a inherent spin and because they have got spin when such nuclei are placed in a magnetic field when what do i why do i say like that what have you done to your sample you have placed it in your magnetic field okay so what happens is that now the energy levels are quantized and exactly what happens is now you are in a position 
that you can see nuclear magnetic resonance for that you have to do something to the system when placed in the magnetic field which will cause absorption okay and nmr of course occurs only when you place the sample in a magnetic field otherwise it is not possible okay also one important thing to remember is the nuclei different nuclei they absorb at different energies and therefore you get different frequency so the nmr equation can you see what is written on this slide the nmr frequency is equal to gamma b upon 2 pi do you know what is gamma uh, i think it is the gyromagnetic ratio yes that is correct and the gamma is a specific property a special property for a particular nucleus or for a particular element okay so what happens is if you look at the equation properly kunika you will come to know that the resonance frequency is proportional to the magnetic field b b is a magnetic field which you are applying okay so anyone which has a higher gamma will show a higher magnetic resonance frequency is so, that clear yes but does that mean that i can do this on any element present in the periodic table no no that is not the truth actually what happens is that for the nmr resonance to be observed or for the nmr phenomenon to occur you have to have an nmr active nucleus okay and which are nmr active nuclei only those nuclei whose spin quantum number i is non zero are nmr active and those that is in short those who which have an atomic number or an atomic mass number which has an odd value will only show an nmr active will be nmr active and will show nmr resonance okay so if i explain to you with respect to the hydrogen nucleus okay the hydrogen nucleus has got how many protons in the nucleus can you tell me uh, so maybe we can ask people to even put it in the chat so if you are listening along how many protons are there in hydrogen okay why don't you put your answer in the chat uh, we'll see what people say yes i think this is good most people know that hydrogen has one proton which is great which is the correct answer okay. yeah that's great okay okay so uh, yeah by the way in the middle there were a few questions uh, you said that it can you can use it for different ph what is ph is just something that tells you whether it's acidic or alkaline yes, right? some yes. number don't worry about it too much yes and uh, there was another question about uh, your what was quantized uh, but we'll come to that in the end don't worry we're going to take a short look at how it works and then we'll see the lab right yes okay yes. so just hold on for a while guys we're going to be showing you the lab in just a bit once you understand a little bit about how nmr works yes. so kunika and uh, uh, Mamta are having a little chat. Okay, that was me getting trapped in the wire in the middle. But uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm out of the wire right now. And uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So as I was telling you, Punika, that I will explain to you with respect to the most abundant and the most sensitive nucleus which we have so far. That is the hydrogen nucleus. Now, what happens as the students pointed out correctly, the audience. that the nucleus of hydrogen has got one proton okay it does not have a neutron okay and therefore whatever whatever is the frequency okay is the of the proton depends on its gamma value as i said earlier if you look at this chart here the the gamma value is the highest for the proton so because whenever we say hydrogen we never refer to hydrogen as hydrogen in the nmr convention we say proton okay it, by default when you say you want to record nmr we take it for granted that you want to record a proton spectrum and also for the same reason when in the beginning i told you that this was a 600 megahertz and this was an 800 megahertz i meant that that was the resonance frequency for the hydrogen or for the proton at that magnetic field is that clear to you so all the spectrometers in the world are known by their hydrogen or by their proton frequency okay so see if you look at the chart again the gamma value okay so mamta if i may ask so 800 megahertz means that 
in this particular machine for the magnetic field that is there in this machine yes. which is some very large field 18 tesla 18 tesla the frequency at which the hydrogen proton will respond is 800 megahertz yes, that that's why correct. it's called an 800 megahertz system correct correct okay. yes okay. okay so proton has got the highest biomagnetic ratio punika the higher natural abundance and that's therefore the highest related sensitivity and that is why it is the nucleus of choice to be observed also if you mostly look at organic compounds what are the nuclei that are present in organic compounds tell me Hi any two hydrogen carbon or yes. nitrogen yeah correct so hydrogen and carbon therefore hydrogen and carbon are most abundantly studied nuclei although they come to resonance at different frequencies also if you see the carbon 13 isotope of carbon is nmr active and not the c12 okay so if you look at the relative sensitivity or the natural abundance of carbon 13 you see how less it is so what does that mean to you about, about it should have a less sensitivity in the instrument yes and that is why it will take more time to get a good uh, carbon 13 nmr spectrum okay is that clear okay so since people are asking to repeat uh, maybe i will just try and ask you the question again so hydrogen there's no problem there is lots of hydrogen yes. all of them have one proton there's nothing to worry about but uh, uh, but for uh, carbon most of the carbon around is carbon 12 yes there's only very little which is carbon 13, 13 yes. and we are sensitive in nmr only to, to the carbon 13 that is perfect yes so because there is so little carbon 13 we sense only those carbons which are carbon 13 and hence the sensitivity is much less compared yes. to that of hydrogen that is correct okay so that's why we have to and we have to look at carbon 13 because we need odd numbers yes yes okay yes. okay so similarly similarly there's nitrogen also yes, right yes there is nitrogen 15 there is phosphorus 31 okay so most of these nuclei if you if you see punica are present in biomolecules okay like amino acids peptides proteins so and that's why i have listed these nuclei here and you can actually observe these nuclei you can record the nmr spectra using these nuclei to get more information of biomolecules and phosphorus is present in nucleic acids nucleotides okay so that is why even phosphorus becomes an important nucleus which is studied by biologists at some point of time besides this there are so many other nuclei like molybdenum selenium silicon calcium okay so many nuclei can be actually seen on the nmr scale but you have to tune your probe or your electronics to see that particular nuclei to get the nmr spectrum okay so can you make this simpler yeah let's start at the beginning yeah okay so now if if i explain to you the basic very basic theory is that as i was telling you the hydrogen nucleus has got one proton and proton inherently has a spin okay so that is why it behaves as a tiny micro magnet okay so very small spin or small magnitude okay magnet but now when you place this proton nucleus now you place the compound in the nmr magnetic field right you saw me putting it there yes and now it means that it has already reached this condition where you are placing the sample in the magnetic field okay now let me just tell you in a lighter way what happens now now schools are closed because of the pandemic okay so what happens when when the schools were running okay it was such a nice time no when schools were there children used to be in the classrooms there were periods one after another where teacher was taking classes so what used to happen when the teacher was not there in the class just when the class used to begin they, everybody used to be in disorder okay they used to be at some other places in groups talking to each other so there was total chaos before the teacher enters the class similarly if you look at this slide when there is no magnetic field 
all the spins are disoriented they are pointing to different directions okay they are axis magnetic field axis just like students are just talking in their group there is no order in the class but as soon as the teacher enters the class everything becomes silent and there is a lot of order they go and quickly sit on their benches open their books and there is a lot of discipline in the class okay similarly the spins are like students as soon as they go see that a magnetic field is set up they either orient themselves with the magnetic field or against the magnetic field can you see here and this is the point where we say we can talk in quantum mechanical terms okay so what happens is that as soon as the magnetic field is there your sample is present in the magnetic field if you look at this particular diagram you will see that the energy levels of that spin system are quantized okay so the spins which are aligned with the field are at a lower energy level and those which are aligned aligned against the field are at a higher energy level and you can see that the difference in the energy between the levels depends on how high the magnetic field is okay so so uh, yes. after that, just looking at questions which have come in yes so the quantized by quantized meaning uh, you're saying that once you apply the magnetic yes. field these atoms have only one of two energies yes if they are aligned with the field they have an energy yes. if they are aligned opposite to the field they have an other energy yes. so only two levels are allowed yes. okay so don't worry about the word quantized it just means that all these let's say they were hydrogen atoms or whatever they have two energy levels either one of them with when they are parallel to or when they are anti parallel to that is it and what we are looking at is the difference between these two energy levels correct okay. so yes. let's go back to the slide there go okay yeah go ahead yes so now this is that particular state in our sample where you can actually observe the nuclear magnetic resonance phenomenon now everything is set okay the only thing you have to do is fetter the system that is disturb the system so that there is some action okay how do you bring about this action kurika do you know uh no i do not know about it but uh, in the term nuclear magnetic resonance i understood what the role nucleus plays uh, what has magnetic field to do here but what is the term resonance what is actually resonating here yeah that's a good question so i'm just going to tell you that now okay this is the slide of the resonance experiment which i am showing you okay so we are now the system is said to be at equilibrium okay now if you want to disturb the equilibrium what do you have to do you have to apply some energy from outside which will perturb the system how do you do this you know punika you apply a radio frequency pulse from the transmitter which will match the energy of that radio frequency pulse should match the energy difference of the energy levels which i showed you in the previous slide okay so what happens is as soon as the matching see resonance is to do with the matching of energy okay so as soon as that energy is provided to these particular nuclei they will absorb absorb that energy and then attain the non equilibrium state okay so what will happen is that flipping of the spins will occur and that will give rise to the resonance which you are asking about okay and this particular resonance is part in the receiver so the circuit of the receiver i'll show you later is present in the probe in which your sample rests okay so there's a question why is this resonance in the radio frequency only that is because the energy which we are looking at okay the magnetic field and the energy which we are looking at lies in the radio frequency range like the other spectroscopy like uv or ir okay they have a specific band of energy for the nmr we only concentrate on the radio wave region of the energy that is why it is radio frequency yeah okay so i have you understood punika yes i understood this but now i am very excited to see how this electronics are 
Like, can you show me the real probe where the sample sits? Yes. Before that, I wanted to tell you one thing, uh, Punika, is that you applied a radio frequency pulse by which resonance has occurred and the system has gone to the non-equilibrium state. Okay. But do you think any system can leave, be there in the non-equilibrium state for an infinite period of time? Ideally not. It should come back to its equilibrium state. Yeah. So there are certain processes which make the system go back to the equilibrium and that is called the NMR relaxation. I'm not going to talk in detail about this now. Maybe later when I take a class, I will explain to you. But because of the NMR relaxation, the excited pins go back to their equilibrium state and therefore you can now again apply another radio frequency pulse and do this process in a repeated way to get you a good NMR spectrum. And this particular process of repeatedly applying radio frequency pulses during the course of one experiment is called as time averaging. Okay, so you finish this process only at the end when you feel that you have got a good NMR spectrum. Okay. Uh, probe, you want to see the probe? Okay. Yes. Okay, so let me show you. So now uh, I, I showed you in the, in the beginning that I put the sample in the NMR. I showed you that I have put the sample in the NMR magnet. Okay. So actually, this is the probe. First, can you can you focus on this probe? Wow, that's a big thing. Yeah. So you see, this is the NMR probe. And if you can look here, I can tune it to either a proton nucleus, okay, or a broadband. Broadband means I can tune it to any nucleus. I can tune it to carbon or nitrogen or molybdenum, or selenium, or tellurium, you name it, and I can tune it, provided I have the electronics in my system to observe that, okay? So this is what is called the probe, okay? So the probe sits inside the magnet, okay? I have, this is an extra probe, that is why I was able to show you. Now, another thing, another thing, I couldn't open this probe because this is a functional probe. But for you to understand better of what actually happens when the sample goes inside, I have got one probe opened for you. Can you see this? The probe is the heart of the NMR spectrometer, okay? And this is where it sits. So you see now the sample, when I put it from top of the magnet, it actually goes and sits here inside the probe. And can you see? there are certain coils here. Can you see here? Okay. So those are the transmitter and the receiver coils which I was talking about. So these coils, when you give a command from your computer, it is this coil which irradiates the sample with the radio frequency pulse. And if you remember, I had also checked the height of the sample by putting it in the height gate. So what I have to do, I have to ensure that the height of the sample is enough so that it sits in that particular part of the probe where it can be irradiated by the RF coil very optimally. Okay, so that is important. Besides, probe has got many other parts, okay, which uh, you will learn later when you learn about the details of the NMR instrument. And this is the cover. I have removed this cover, okay. Normally, it is put on top and then the probe is inserted from the bottom of the magnet. Is it clear to you? To yes. Yeah. Yeah. So shall we go back to our desk? So it is a really complicated electronics involved. Yes, true. And very expensive too. A probe can cost anything between 50 lakhs to 1 crore. Just for that probe? Yes. Wow. Because you, you have advanced probes for advanced molecules. You have a cryo probe for biomolecules. Yes. So, uh, Punika, have you ever uh, wondered how an uh, animal spectrum of plain water, drinking water would look like? Till now, what I have learned, what I can think of is 
uh, as water molecule is h2o and it has got two protons so ideally it should give two peaks corresponding to the two protons is it correct uh, actually it's not completely correct so what happens is that there is something called molecular symmetry concept which is important in chemistry which is important in nmr2 so if you look at this particular molecule you put your sample of water in your nmr magnet and then you record the nmr spectra so because the h both the h's okay are similar okay there is a molecular symmetry in the molecule they will come to resonance at the same position on the nmr chemical shift scale so can you see that is why you are seeing only one peak okay but i would like you to tell me how will the nmr spectrum of coconut water look like punika coconut water uh, it is also water so it should also give me one peak corresponding to the uh, protons the symmetric protons no so the surprising thing is you look at the spectrum of coconut water see there are so many peaks are you surprised yes i am really amazed why are there so many peaks are these impurities no actually they are not impurities if you know coconut water has got so many other nutrients minerals okay besides if you if you have ever taken coconut water from any local vendor you must have asked him ki bhai meetha pani wala chahiye zyada malai wala chahiye you know according to your taste so coconut water in addition to a lot of water content has got many other peaks coming from species like minerals like okay like minerals like calcium potassium magnesium and you get fruit acids okay then you you get amino acids okay like you, there are so many amino acids which you can see malic acid or glutamic acid or anything like that okay so if you look at the nmr spectrum of coconut water you will see only the proton species coming to resonance so all which i am showing here is only the proton spectrum you will not be seeing the peaks corresponding to the minerals that is the calcium or the magnesium or the potassium because i have tuned my probe only to observing the proton okay but now i got confused with one thing we told that proton processes at one particular resonates at one particular frequency then why the, all the other protons are the, like we are getting so many peaks for a proton nuclei only yeah, that is a brilliant question punika that shows that, that you are actually interested in learning nmr so basically we are getting so many peaks and that is the reason why nmr becomes such a versatile technique if we would have got only one peak for all the hydrogens in the world in all the compounds nmr spectroscopy wouldn't have been worthwhile at all so if you see the equation which i showed you in the beginning that is the mu is equal to gamma b upon 2 pi okay that says that the frequency is dependent on the magnetic field b so what it means is that as you said at a particular magnetic field there will be only one resonance frequency for the pro, for any species of nuclei that is the proton but why are we getting so many peaks so if you can you look at this particular molecule what is it can you tell me uh, ch3oh it is methanol yes correct so consider that before i substitute one of the hydrogens of methanol okay of methane with oh what would it be it would be methane right and what is the spectrum of methane now you should be able to tell me it should show only one peak because the Correct. molecule is also symmetric yes but now when i substitute one hydrogen with an oh group what happens is that the oxygen which is present now in the molecule it is an electronegative atom okay so what it does is that it pulls the electron density of that hydrogen to which it is attached towards itself thereby exposing that hydrogen to more magnetic field it's like you know if you are wearing a jacket because you are feeling cold and i pull off your jacket what will you feel you feel cold yes so similarly that particular hydrogen whose electron density jacket is pulled by oxygen towards itself it is more exposed to the magnetic field in which we have put the sample and therefore 
what happens is that it needs less magnetic field to come to resonance so now i have shown for you the molecule the nmr spectrum of ethanol ch3 ch2 oh because it has got three different types of protons so you see the oh okay the the left hand side is the lower field of the scale and the right hand side is the higher field so the oh comes to resonance at the lowest field and the ch3 which is away from the oh comes to resonance at the highest field that is called shielding and deshielding effect okay so this is called the deshielding effect pulling the electron density towards itself and exposing that hydrogen to the magnetic field is the deshielding effect because of the shielding and deshielding effect the nmr chemical shift scale is come into existence okay uh, so this is something like earlier in methane all four hydrogens had they were the same i mean they all had yes. they were to one carbon now because one of their sort of neighbors has changed right one of those hydrogens is actually now connected to an oxygen yes uh, there are now like two different kinds of hydrogen yes okay but there's a question saying could you please explain the shielding and deshielding uh, once more okay exactly what is happening so maybe you can just just explain uh, so you know just qualitatively what is shielding and deshielding yeah. and the idea that different hydrogen atoms in a different environment will have slightly different frequency yes that's yes. the that's the game yeah. so if, okay. if you want me to explain again i can say that whenever there is a chemical bond between two species like there is a, this is a bond between oxygen and hydrogen and that is connected to the ch3 so what happens is that in the bond is mediated through the electrons which are present in that and that is why what happens that we call something called the electron density okay so the electron density is pulled towards the oxygen because it has got the capacity to pull it towards itself okay and therefore the hydrogen is more exposed because its jacket of electron density gets pulled towards the oxygen and therefore hydrogen being slightly more exposed in the magnetic field it will come to resonance at a lower magnetic field as compared to the other hydrogens present in that molecule okay. i hope this is so, clear so so these atoms so the the frequency is decided not only by the nucleus but also by the shielding around it yes. which is the electrons around the nucleus yes and different atoms pull these electrons towards themselves or away from themselves or whatever and hence change the local density around every individual hydrogen hence these hydrogens behave differently and we can distinguish whether a hydrogen is attached to carbon or is it attached to oxygen yes perfect that is the correct way of putting it okay, okay let's go on yes so now if if you are recording the nmr spectrum at say 60 megahertz kunika so because of this shielding and deshielding effects you will find that you your resonance frequency of all protons is slightly plus or minus 60 mega so one may be 59.99995 the other one will be 59.99997 and the other another one will be 59.99982 so is are these huge values and every time to say such big uh, numerics is a tedious thing yes that's what i was thinking then how do we do uh, deal with these numbers yeah so if you if you see the nmr spectrum which i'll be showing you on my screen you see that the the scale the nmr scale is not the hertz scale or not the megahertz scale which i am telling you now but it is converted to a ppm scale a parts per million scale by taking a ratio of the frequency values of each proton and because we are taking a ratio it does not have units you call it a ppm scale and it is easier to refer to the delta value and therefore whether you record your sample on a 50 megahertz or a 500 megahertz or a 900 megahertz you will always find that the delta scale ppm values will not change from one spectrum one spectrometer to another okay so you, you take the chemical shift ppm scale 
And if you look at the PPM scale chart in NMRs, you will find that for the hydrogen or for the proton NMR chemical shift, the range for the PPM values is 0 to 15 PPM. And depending on the shielding and de-shielding factors associated with different chemical environments, you have the aliphatic protons, the alcohols, and the olefins coming in the region of 0 to 5. And the others like aromatics or amides or acids or aldehydes, they are coming to resonance between 5 to 15 ppm. Okay, is that clear to you? Yes, this has actually made our lives quite easier. Yes, true. So basically, by looking at how different, how shifted it is from a proton by itself, we can actually figure out what it was attached to. Yes, you get a rough idea of what it is attached to. Wow. So this is how you can figure out what those hydrogens are attached to in the structure. Yes. So okay. that is why also, Unika, I will just like to bring to your notice that in, in the IR, if you record an IR spectrum and you have a chloro group in your molecule, you will come to, you will get a band between 3200 to 3600 per centimeter. But that will not tell you where exactly the chlorine group is located. Whereas if you record an NMR spectrum, from the chemical shift of each and every proton in your compound, you will come to know which is the proton to which that chlorine group is attached. Isn't that more detailed information? Yes, I think that what, that's what makes NMR so powerful. Yes, that is why it is so powerful and versatile. So I have another question. Like if I record a spectra on any NMR instrument, so we get the same PPM value. So yes. why do we have such, like, why is there a higher frequency uh, instrument for NMR? Okay, that's a great question. Why do we have so many high field instruments? Yes. And so many expensive ones. Yes, okay. So the, the molecule which you want to characterize, Punika, can you tell me the molecular weight of that compound, roughly? It's roughly 628. Okay, so that means that it is a small molecule. Okay? Yes. A medium sized molecule, okay? So this particular molecule, you can easily characterize on a 400 megahertz or a 500 megahertz. But what will happen if you are looking at a biomolecule, which has got molecular weight in kilodalton, okay, maybe 10,000, 20,000, then you will get a very complicated NMR spectrum. And it will not be enough for you to characterize that molecule so easily. So one of the reasons why people go to higher fields is because they want to study bigger molecules, the structure of proteins or nucleic acids, the conformations of these biomolecules. Okay. So let me show you one spectrum. There are two spectra on this. Can you see Kunika for this particular compound, organic compound? Okay. So one is a 43 megahertz spectrum and the other one is a 600 megahertz spectrum. Can you tell me what is the difference? It is the same molecule. Uh, the lower one, the one recorded in 600 megahertz, it appears more sharp and the splittings are also pretty, pretty nicely visible. Yeah, so perfect. That's what the observation I wanted you to make. So what does it mean? That when you record it at lower field, you do not get enough splittings. You do not get enough resolution or enough sharp peaks. If you record the same spectrum, the same sample at a higher field, you will get the splitting. That is, you will get information about the neighboring atoms also. That is a splitting pattern, which I haven't told you earlier. So you see some peaks are triplets, some are quartets, some are singlets. Okay. So that is also some more information which you get from an NMR spectrum, which may not be possible on a low field spectrometer. Okay. Also, another this is the question you wanted me to address. Spectra are simplified, as I said, overlapping multiplets. That is, the splitting patterns are separated. And there is something called first order and second order coupling, which you will learn when you do more theory about NMR. I cannot tell you in this short time. They will get minimized, making your spectrum easier to analyze. However, Unika, it is, these high field spectrometers are very, very expensive. One more advantage you get when you do at higher field is that you get better signal to noise ratio. 
okay yeah so look at the look at the sensitivity improvement as you go this is the magnetic field x axis and the relative signal to noise ratio that is how good your nmr spectrum looks the signal to noise is the sensitivity how it has improved with the improvement improvement or increase in the magnetic field okay so on a higher field magnet what happens is you have to record your spectrum for less time then what you do it on a low field spectrum so is it that if i have a high field instrument i will always get a good spectra no no that is not true on a high field experiment like if you put your sample in the magnet and just start the experiment you are not going to get a good spectrum see what what are the important factors to get a good spectrum are yeah you have to have the right solvent you have to prepare your sample properly you have to adjust the homogeneity and you have to give the right parameters so it's not automatic that on high field you will get good spectrum and since you have brought the topic of high field i wanted you to understand that earlier when people had access to only low field spectrometers they were able to only look at or characterize small molecules but because of advancement in magnetic field electronics and probe better probes and computers what has happened over the decades now people were able to look at bigger molecules and now today people are able to solve the structures of large bio molecules with molecular weight greater than 700 kilo dalton like in our lab our uh, one of our students has solved the structure of hiv one protease okay one particular big protein which is important for the sustenance of the you you must have heard about hiv okay so he has found out the holding hierarchy of this protein okay which will probably lead us to some treatment for this hiv uh, disease okay immunodeficiency syndrome so solving of all these complicated structures can also can be done using this proton nmr only no no actually if you as i was showing you we have earlier if you look at this particular picture this is the picture we have i have taken of an old nmr spectrometer which was there in our lab okay so i just uh, show you these pictures the new spectrometers look like that these are the probes and this is the magnet where uh, the probe actually the sample sits in the most homogeneous part of the magnet so this is what is inside these big yes, cylinders yes. that we this see this is here. actually a magnet which is cut to show you how the superconducting coil inside the magnet looks okay this is the mri which doctors tell you to take so you see how the human being is inserted so it's a horizontal bore magnet and ours is a vertical bore magnet okay so there are uh, several other applications which i would like to tell you but now because of less time i will just flip through these in food technology just, just skip this let's get to the yeah okay so now uh, if we have time we will go through this i wanted to show you how we record the nmr spectrum of methyl menthol menthol okay so this is uh, this is how so, menthol so looks so i think the first thing i think we should tell our audience is that recording the spectrum takes some time so yes. these are spectra which we have actually recorded for you before the session but we will try and now explain how one takes an nmr spectrum and actually finds out what the structure of a molecule is okay which is what many people are asking so this is what we'll try to do okay so what do we have on the screen here mamta yeah so this is the proton spectrum of menthol this is the spectrum of menthol menthol is the thing which yeah so this the, i have put the picture of menthol here okay this okay. is menthol yes yes okay so, so this is menthol so, menthol is a, a compound yeah. which has C many different kinds of carbons yes so the formula is c10 h20 o okay so if you look at the proton spectrum it is not very easy to determine the which proton is which okay there are if you look if you can uh, 
just uh, focus on this or not i can show you that there are so many splittings okay it's it's a bit complicated although it is not very complicated like so a biomolecule that small little peak is actually many small peaks together yes there is splitting because of its neighboring protons okay can you see that yeah this is how it looks Oh, there are some beautiful shapes to these peaks. Yes, so you get this very good splitting because you have recorded it on a high field spectrometer, the eight hundred megahertz. Okay, so this is the proton spectrum. Now, if I record a proton spectrum and I am able to assign all my hydrogens, then I am done with it. I can do the characterization of my compound. But if it is a bit complicated, like how the menthol molecule is, then what I do is. i record the carbon 13 spectrum also so this is how the carbon 13 spectrum looks like just a second yeah so can you can you uh, focus on this or not yes yeah so now this this particular small peak is coming from the solvent you please ignore that okay but if you count the number of carbons you have got 1 2 3 4 Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You have got ten carbons. I am telling you to ignore this. Okay. Yeah. So if you look again, pan the camera here. So I am getting H twenty in the proton spectrum, which I am not able to analyze easily. That is why I recorded the carbon spectrum. So because I have got ten carbon in my carbon spectrum, it means that. the menthol which i have put in the magnet is pure if there would have been some problem in it if it would have been impure i would have got more than 10 carbons okay so i can try to assign the spectrum based on this but i have got even more advanced techniques which i can do to make my life easier to make the analysis easier for me what is that it is a proton edited carbon spectrum that is called the Depth one thirty five. I don't want to go into the details, but I'll show you the spectrum, Arna. Yeah. So can you see the spectrum, Arna? Now. Yeah, this has something Do going you know? up, something going down. Yes. So what does this particular experiment do? Is that it makes the CH two negative. That is the carbons attached to H two. That is the methylenes. They come negative. and the carbons which are attached to the ch's that is the methanes or the methyls the ch3s they will come positive so don't you think it has made it a bit more easy for me to do the analysis now i know the chemical shift wise that these are the methylenes and among these these are either the methyls or the methane So there are three. This tells you that there are three CH twos in this molecule. Yes, yes. True. Okay, so we know there are three CH twos, and the ones on top are either CH three or CH. CHs. Yes. Or CH. Okay. So now there is actually on the basis of a depth one thirty five spectrum, this particular advanced experiment which I have done, I will be able to do the analysis. But just for your information, I have done. even one more experiment which i would like to show you is the 2d experiment the correlation experiment which is a advanced experiment which we do for biomolecules so here you see that those ch2s which were seen as negative in the carbon depth spectrum they are coming as red peaks okay and because one carbon this is the carbon axis or no okay and this is the proton axis okay so down. this is some way don't worry if you don't understand this 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 is like this is not really a graph like you saw earlier this is some correlation between carbon what you saw in the hydrogen. carbon graph and what you saw in the hydrogen the proton graph and by comparing how these things are related to each other the shifts on the hydrogen axis and the shifts on the carbon axis uh they give us little spots in this yes and from these spots so i see there are six red spots here yeah so six red spots but if you see the horizontal line is passing through the same carbon correct resonance okay so 
so that means that these hydrogens are from the same carbon mm -hmm. these hydrogens are from the same carbon these hydrogens are again from the same carbon so this makes our life very much simple so this was just to show you how we do the analysis for biomolecules that is proteins so in proteins what happens is that we also have in addition to the carbon hydrogen correlation we have a nitrogen proton correlation okay where you get the nitrogen from the amino acid backbone which comes from amino acids like for example alanine or glutamine or glycine and then we try to solve the structure of protein so i hope uh, i have been able to give a rough uh, estimate of how we run the experiments on slightly bigger molecules which do not give us simple spectra in the proton nmr so but just going back to this example where we did the the menthol spectra yes what you first did was you took a hydrogen spectrum the yes. proton spectrum yes that told us that there were 20 hydrogens in the uh, did it tell us there were 20 From yeah that, you can you can count the 20 because you can, you can the integrate 20. them you can okay. quantify you them you can quantify that there are how many hydrogens in it then of course we know that there are different types of hydrogens because there are different types of uh, environments around them so yes. you have a ch3 you have some ch2s you have a ch you have one of them attached oh, to a oxygen so there are different kinds of hydrogens yes now we still don't know which one is where so then we try to see okay where are the carb what kind of carbons yes, are there yes so then you did a carbon uh, carbon uh, a carbon NMR. nmr and in the carbon nmr uh, of course this is carbon 13 yes. uh, you found out that there were 10 carbon atoms so now you know that there are 10 carbon yes. atoms and there were uh, 20 things Protons. yes then you did another experiment which specifically told you how many ch2s were there yes so once you know how many ch2s are there that helps you even simplify the structure even more correct and similarly there are advanced techniques that one can use to uh, sort of correlate the positions of these carbons yes, which and carbon hydrogens is attached to which, which carbon hydrogen? is attached to which hydrogen yes. and that allows us to solve the structure not just for menthol but for even bigger molecules that yes, are there yes okay great this is this is fantastic now there are lots and lots and lots of questions so I think what we'll do is we'll keep this camera on a stand and then uh, I'm going to go to back to YouTube and try and pick up the questions from sure, the, sure. the Zoom and the YouTube uh, thing. So uh, let's keep the thing here. And uh, okay, uh, let's let's see. So, ooh, there are lots and lots and lots of questions here. So uh, yeah, why don't you just freeze this? Okay, good. Uh, I will start with... Uh, let's start with questions on. We'll, we'll go between Zoom and uh, please put your questions in the chat because that's the only way we can, uh, uh, you know, get some feedback from you. So, uh, uh, okay, we'll come to applications in a in a. Uh, okay, why? So if you have an even uh, atom, whatever you remember, you said you need odd. If it is even, why don't you get an NMR signal? That's a question. Because the, because the magnetic moments, they cancel each other. And there is no net magnetic moment, which enables the things to interact with the magnetic field. Okay. So uh, the answer is because the magnetic moments cancel out and there is no net magnetic field. Okay. That was asked by uh, uh, Prasad. Uh, so in, in when we are doing the experiment, uh, is the frequency kept constant and the magnetic field changes or the magnetic field is constant and the frequency changes? What is changing inside this? It's a very good question. Okay, I would like to uh, answer this question in detail. See, as I showed you in the earlier, in the earlier ages, people used to do it that way. When we did not have modern NMR spectrometer, they used to keep the frequency constant and they used to scan the magnetic field from lower magnetic field to higher magnetic field. And as and when there used to be a resonance, you used to get it in the chart recorder. There were no computers at that time. But then with advancement in technology, what, what came was that we got superconducting magnets. Those magnets were 
permanent magnets or electromagnets okay and this was very time consuming so you can imagine that scanning from low field to a high field would used to take anything between 5 minutes to 9 minutes and if you want to repeat that to get a good spectrum what you have to do is you have to repeat the cycle maybe for 10 minutes 10 times 20 times so it would have taken hours to get a good spectrum especially for samples which were dilute for concentrated samples you can get it within a few cycles so scientists were ambitious they want to solve structures of bigger and bigger quantities maybe at lower concentrations the sample may not be available in plenty so intelligent people means they are they come out with solutions to this so curiosity and necessity is the mother of invention you know that right so what they did was professor richard ons who actually got the nobel laureate in 1991 he used to think that what do i do to get an nmr spectrum faster and to be able to record dilute samples also within less time and when he was in the varian company in the 1960s he and his team they found that when they could irradiate the particular sample in a superconducting magnet with a radio frequency burst of energy which will bring to resonance all of the spins or all the nuclei at the same time then they will do they will be able to do this within a split second or less than one second that is the idea of pulsed nmr okay again i think pulse p u l s e d applying a radio frequency pulse and then you collect the data in the computer and fourier transform and get the nmr spectrum whenever you want so that was actually the invention which revolutionized the nmr field and you could now record one scan that is one cycle in one second and therefore you will get a dilute sample recorded within no time repeating it maybe 100 times in one minute second it's become as easy as that so essentially right now the magnetic field is constant. constant what we vary is the frequency but again we don't vary the frequency by slowly changing the frequency no. we put a pulse and the pulse is such that it actually has many frequencies in it and we can extract from the data that comes back what the individual uh, things were this is a technique called a fourier transform so don't worry about it right, you know right. but mathematically it is possible to send a pulse which has many frequencies embedded in it and then extract the information from it so that is that is what is done now you said one thing this is a superconducting magnet right yes. so uh, a superconductor actually once the current starts flowing it flows right yes so has this magnet how long is this magnet working yeah so see when when you say a superconducting magnet it means that we have a inside the magnet a superconducting coil which is made of a special alloy let's say niobium titanium alloy okay uh, i have had one slide of a magnet in my computer and what happens is when the magnet is charged for the first time that time only you bring an external power supply and put through put a current through the circuit inside the superconducting coil and slowly you insert the current okay by increasing the voltage once it reaches a value let's say 100 amperes then the magnet is at 18 tesla okay so this takes a lot of time in the beginning and then once the current remains circulating in the in the coil then you remove the power supply you remove the circuit then you close the circuit and the magnet superconducting co co coil it remains in the persistent mode so now so this magnet this machine that is there over here this big one yes. when was this uh, when was this magnet sort of 2005. started up this was installed in 2005 and now i don't have to worry about the power cut so from uh, 2005 this magnet has been just on the current yes. is flowing yes. without any external thing being but there is a catch arna you are superconducting magnets come at the fast because you need to immerse them in liquid helium the temperature of liquid helium is 4k which is minus 269 degrees centigrade so you have to always have the coil immersed in a certain quantity 
of liquid helium so it is expensive and so most to... of this most of this is actually just a big insulated thing in which you can have liquid helium inside yes and no. the superconductor inside the liquid helium yes so i have to keep on topping the liquid helium every month for this magnet but for the new generation magnet the 600 megawatt is a new generation magnet and that is why the helium whole time is more what does that mean it means that i have to fill liquid helium maybe once every 3 or 4 months but this i have to top up every month otherwise the magnet if the helium level goes down the magnet will quench okay let's uh, let's switch to zoom for a change and see if we have questions here um uh, i'm sure there are lots and lots of lots of questions uh oh many people are asking how costly is this so today if you go to buy this particular instrument the 800 mega it will cost you anything between 25 to 30 crores that is the capital investment cost and then the maintenance running cost are also a lot and the thing about uh, earn up about these magnets and these instruments is that we use it 24 by 7 like how we have our channels these tv channels running because whether i use this or not it has to be always on field and the electronics is always kept run so our all both our instruments run mostly 24 by 7 so uh, which is why i think we should explain i mean many people are asking you know are we going to do a live experiment uh, i i answered in the chat on the zoom but even for our youtube viewers viewers uh, the thing is this is the national nmr facility these machines are running 24/7 so it's really you know and they are usually used for solving structures of big protein molecules or bio molecules or you know so uh thankfully mamta had taken some time and done this menthol spectra in the middle when she had the had the time to do it because right now there's actually something running in these systems we cannot just put our own sample we want to do a very simple thing to show you but still we can't put the sample in so uh, what uh, mamta had done was she had taken the spectrum maybe a few days back uh, you know so it's not possible to show you a live experiment being done we did show you Kunika loading her sample inside the uh, variance spectrometer because she is the one who is going to be using it uh, the next time. But it's actually a pretty complex thing because uh, even Kunika, uh, you know that sample you had. What was the liquid you put over there? Did you just dissolve it in water? No. So we have to dissolve it in any solvent in which the compound is soluble, and it has to be a diluted solvent. Ah, so you can't have hydrogen molecules in that no, solvent. No, because otherwise you will see those protons also there, and you will be confused that where the protons are coming from. Like, is it from my compound or is so, it from the solvent? So, so instead of water, what do you use? Ah, uh, in my case, I have used chloroform. That is CdCl3. Uh, actually, chloroform is ChCl3, but here I have used diluted C, uh, chloroform. That is CdCl3. Okay, so instead of hydrogen, they put deuterium to make these deuterium, solvents. Deuterium, yes. And these solvents are easily available? No, not at all. These are pretty costly solvents, and you have to. Uh, I can show you one. Unfuse. Good one. So this is a actually, if you see, this is a deuterium oxide. So this is water actually, deuterated water, and these. Cost somewhere around two hundred to four hundred each ampule, and this is not even one mL. If you notice, this is point five mL, and this is the solvent we require to record one per one spectra. So, so this you will need be to consumed. buy. So this is basically heavy. Uh, it's not even heavy water. It's pure deuterium oxide. Yes. Pure deuterium oxide is what you would use instead of water. Instead of water. Half a milliliter costs a few hundred rupees. Yes, and this is wow. So that's almost yeah. a few lakhs a liter. Even. doing an experiment on it in on this costly instrument is really costly okay so yeah so this is the kind of uh, solvent you need so you have deuterated versions of all solvent you need yes yes we have such ampules for all the solvents we require okay all right so that also takes care of one question uh, of what was the solvent very good uh, let me go back to the chat and see what questions we have uh, okay somebody um, says ma'am you said that the 800 megahertz nmr machine only detects protons of that frequency but uh, won't detection of a proton having less than 800 megahertz frequency also happen 
no on this particular spectrometer we cannot record uh, other than 800 for a proton so this is only for 800 only for 800 but then we we do have a very small difference right it's going to be 800 point something 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 you know the that is the concept of chemical shift right right okay. so only in that range so yes. there is a very small range around 800 that you can yes. right but oh. it's mostly it's very very close to remember these shifts are parts per million very small shifts okay uh let me go back to zoom for a change uh, no let's go back to youtube for a change uh okay uh all right okay i are there any questions on facebook uh no questions on facebook okay let's go back to uh, zoom then there are many questions here chat at least uh yeah there is a question is a visit to the facility possible it will be possible after the pandemic restrictions are lifted we yeah. do organize uh, visits for school kids and university kids but because of the pandemic everything is closed we are so sorry about it. yeah so it, we we do have groups of school or college students coming here sometimes but currently because of restrictions due to covid it's not happening but yes these visits do happen uh, especially on national science day uh, the sunday closes to 28th february typically tfr labs are open for the public to come and see uh, so if you really want to come and see you can you can certainly uh, certainly do that okay so uh, somebody is asking what are the solvents used apart from pdcl3 and deuterated water uh, so we use uh, deuterated DMSO. So As maybe we can just show yeah, them the whole yeah, solvent table. Uh, let's just look at all the solvents here, and Kunika, you can tell us all what is there. So, so this is acetic acid, deuterated. So all these solvents which I am showing you are deuterated. Uh, this is pyridine. You can see acetic acid, acetone, methanol, and on all these we have these ampules. You see, these are ampules which are one time use. Uh, they are somewhere up. 0.5 or 0.6 ml ampules yeah okay so these are the kind of solvents you these have these are the kind of solvents we use and there are there is dmso also that we frequently use okay and even like if some compounds are really non polar so we have benzene for that so like depending on what solvents you require to dissolve your compounds in you have solvents and they have to be just deuterated So this is like C six D six. C six D six. Yes. Wow. Okay. Uh, uh, do we need to pay for coming? No. On, on the National Science Day, you can you can visit for. Uh, you don't have to pay. We are very happy to show you. This is a, a government facility, a national facility. We are very happy to show you. But if it is. uh if it is uh, uh what's the cost of one ampule you said a uh, few hundred rupees yeah right? somewhere around 200 to 400 depending that, on the solvent depending for, on the solvent, solvent and that's just for less than about less than a million yes. okay however uh, arda uh, i would like to say that people who use this is this is a national facility people from all over the country from different universities industries academic institutes they come uh, or now they take their samples they are not allowed to come personally because of again pandemic restrictions but they have to pay for their nmr usage okay so we have different rates for academic institutes and slightly higher rates for industries okay. so only to use the nmr uh, spectrometer there is a charge okay and uh, uh, let's see uh, Okay, how do you how do you analyze uh, molecules? Wait, where is? I mean, I just lost the question. There are so many of them coming in. Uh, okay. One question is, how do you select the solvent for a particular compound of interest? Yes. Uh, it depends upon the solubility of your compound. 
so uh, you have to first dissolve these uh, like if the compound of your interest in the normal solvent mm -hmm. like let's say i start dissolving depending on the polarity like i i start dissolving it in water methanol or say cdcl uh, like chloroform so whatever it is in soluble in i will take the diluted version of that particular solvent and make my sample for it so so uh, it is essential that the compound should be soluble yes, and absolutely. it should be uh, the solvent should be such that it doesn't give you a background that, uh, yes. that is for so that let me right. ask uh, another question: Is it possible to do solid state NMR? It is, but you cannot do solid state NMR in a spectrometer which is meant for solution NMR. So NMR. these spectrometers are meant for yes. NMR, uh, are meant for solution NMR. Uh, DIFR also has a part of the national NMR facility at Hyderabad, Hyderabad where. People do uh, perform solid state NMR experiments as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. The question is, can we record other than hydrogen and carbon, for example, fluorine, etc.? Yes. In which case, what is the method to be followed? How do you get the spectra? Similar method. The only thing is, as I said, in the probe, you have to have the probe which you can tune to that particular nucleus, and then you have to adjust your electronics, which will be able to observe that particular nucleus. That's it. You, when you have these things, you can see that particular nucleus which you want to observe. So every probe, these probes are meant for specific yes. nuclei. Depending on the requirement of each laboratory, they buy those probes. Probe is a consumable. Okay, like you buy soap, right? You like you like this particular. You want this soap. You want that soap. Okay, like that. You buy a probe, but it is expensive again. You you buy only those probes which you are going to use. Okay. Uh, there is somebody. Somebody is asking, what is the zero of uh, the chemical shift? Is it a particular hydrogen attached to something? Yeah, it is TMS, tetramethyl so, silane, which is the most shielded proton. Okay, which will come as zero ppm. So by definition or by convention. Vitamin. There is a compound called, called TMS tetramethyl silane. Tetramethyl silane, which is basically silicon with four, four methyl, methyl groups, groups attached to it. The value of the the position of the hydrogen uh, spectrum there is taken as zero mm -hmm. for the purposes of ppm measuring. That's the zero. Okay. Uh, What is D2O exchangeable? I don't understand the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is, is it? So whoever has asked that question. Uh, somebody, what is D2O exchangeable? Please explain as a question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a bit of complicated question. It's not everybody will be able to understand. Okay. So for example, if you're if you're recording the NMR spectrum of an amino acid of a peptide which has got NH protons. Okay, basically before that, I think let's uh, on YouTube. There's a simpler question. What do you mean by deuterated solvent? What are deuterated solvents? Okay, so for, uh, hydrogen has isotopes. So a non uh, hydrogen has various isotopes like protium, deuterium. So protium so, is the one which is abundant in nature. So mostly in all your compounds and organic compounds, the hydrogen we refer to is protium. With one proton, with zero neutrons. Yes. So uh, that is the most abundant one. So we take the deuterated version, that is the higher version, which has one proton and one neutron, for the uh, NMR solvent, so that we do not get peaks corresponding to it. Because, because it is you know, odd. It is not. I mean, it's not odd. It's even. It's because... even number. So it, it, uh, the nuclei spin is not the one which will resonate in the NMR instrument. So we will get only the peaks corresponding to the protons in our molecule. Okay, yes, now go back to D2O. Uh... Yeah, so if you are recording the spectrum of an amino acid which has got amides, that is NH2s, okay, or the amide bond has got NH, okay, so what happens is that if you record the spectrum in, in any spectrometer, you will get peaks corresponding to the NHs, okay, somewhere in the low field region, again, okay? because of the shielding or the de shielding effect. So if you are recording this, in D2O, okay. D2O, or if you are recording it in the organic solvent, you will get the NH peaks. Afterwards, after recording it in an organic solvent, if you add a couple of drops of D2O to this particular solution, then what will happen is that those protons which are labile, 
that is easily exchangeable will become as nh will become nb and therefore depending on the exchange rate of this particular proton h to b you will get either a broad peak or you will not see that peak that peak will disappear so many people they do a deuterium exchange experiment to delineate whether there are nhs present in their molecule i hope this answers your question so this in a way uh, improves the trust in the data for an experiment is that correct yes means it, it you can double check okay yeah. so it's by a, doing you know that okay nh is coming at maybe 8.2 but you are not sure okay so you do you add a, you may uh, record the spectrum and then you remove the sample from the magnet you add about two to three drops of b2o you shake the sample you again put it in the nmr magnet so what happens is that because you have shaken the sample the nhs may have become nbs so you again record the nh uh, the spectrum you find that the h nh has become broader or it has disappeared whereas all the other ch3 ch2 ch they are not exchangeable they will remain intact and only that particular hydrogen will get exchanged that is called deuterium exchange experiment okay uh, let's see what else has not been answered i think some questions are coming again uh, the cost of the ampule we've said it's about 200 to 400 rupees for half a milliliter which is 4 lakhs to 8 lakh rupees a liter if that makes more sense to you hello okay uh, we've done the fluorine question uh okay i think we've run out of all the questions over here uh let me quickly check the youtube window uh again uh okay anything on facebook nothing on facebook okay in and already almost it's past uh, we are 10 minutes past the time so maybe uh, i'm going to hop in over there and uh, Uh, let me see if i can squeeze in somehow it's okay uh, so uh, i'd like to thank mamta for spending all her time by the way she's been here at the nmr facility at the ir for 34 years yes 34 years she's been working on nmr for this facility here for 34 years she has seen this from the old style machines to the most modern machines we have today she has been with the facility and i would really like to thank her that she could manage to squeeze in a small sample for us in the midst of all their regular work just so that we could give you an idea of how we use nmr to detect the structure of a simple molecule like methanol and thanks kunika you appeared at the right time with your sample so we could actually capture you loading your sample over there and thank you for having the chat uh, i'm not a chemist i didn't more than confident of doing this uh, but i hope you liked this session uh, do join in for giant why we are always there we will be online certainly online for the next two sessions in october as well 17th october and 31st october are definitely online sessions in case the government allows our venues to open in november we may go back to having physical sessions which will also be online so we will always be there online now now that we can we, we get audience from everywhere but in case we can go back to having physical sessions nothing like it we will also try that but remember the next two sessions are certainly online follow us on facebook twitter youtube and you will come to know of it if you want to join our mailing list it's outreach send an email to outreach o u t r e a c h at p i f r dot r e s dot i n and we will add you to our mailing list as well stay safe have the rest of the weekend enjoy it and keep tuning in to chai and why thank you All the best.